So last week, Mark Francis talked about the habits of the proactive practitioner and described various forms of practice that embody design activism. One of those types of practice is service learning. So today's speaker, Patsy Owens, will be talking about what service learning is and how service learning is an integral part of landscape architecture education. Many of you know Patsy Owens is an associate professor here in the landscape architecture program and uh, has been on the faculty since 1999. Prior to that, she was teaching at uh, Virginia Tech. Much of Professor Owens' research focuses on uh, adolescent issues and the built environment, as well as different forms of uh, community participation, uh, especially uh, focused on, on youth engagement. So she's, she's known for this, uh, this work here and internationally and has a number of research projects. We're collaborating right now on a regional youth disparities project in the Sacramento region. But she also has collaborative efforts with researchers in uh, Great Britain and Scotland, I believe, uh, probably other countries as well. Um, so please join me in welcoming Patsy Owens. Jeez, hoots and hollers, I don't know. <laughs> I recognize some familiar faces here. This is great to see you guys. One of the things that's important about service learning is giving students and the faculty, as well as the, the communities that you're working with, an opportunity to reflect and to really think about what it is that you're getting out of that project and what are you learning from that project and what can you take from that. It's not just presenting an opportunity that here's a real site, here's a real client, let's go in, do a design, and leave from that but it's really trying to learn and to engage with the people in that. Uh, one, of the tradition, or the, one of the definitions is it's an active, creative pedagogy that integrates community service with academic study in order to enhance the student's capacity to cr think critically, solve problems practically, and function as a lifelong moral democratic citizen in a democratic society. Our professions, as I said, we've really used this model of service learning for years. But we haven't been as good as many of the other professions, particularly educators and health educators, as far as writing and thinking about these re real world opportunities that we have for our students. And so most of the literature really comes out of those professions. And so we really need to look to them for some of the things as far as you know, what have been some of the models and some of the things that have been positive from service learning. From early on, it was imagined that service learning opportunities would really have an impact in these communities, uh, that universities had resources that maybe weren't available to a lot of communities. You know, we have students, faculty, staff, libraries, technologies, our research expertise, all these things that we can take into these partnerships with communities. Um, we also see that we have a tradition of service learning that we can help to strengthen economic development in a region. Uh, that we can address those educational and health needs. And I think from our point of view, the other design and planning kind of needs that they have, and that the university can help to contribute to their cultural life. Some of the benefits for students is their uh, increased ability to apply their learning to these kind of real world situations. Uh, that the, some of the studies have found that students have an increased capacity to be able to solve problems. They're able to look at things more holistically and approach them. Uh, that they actually have shown that they've been improved writing and critical thinking skills, that there's been improvements in test scores for students that have participated in these kind of activities. Uh, career development has benefits. Uh, there's stronger faculty-student relationships. I know the students that I have more longer-term relationships with, the ones that I continue to get emails from, from when I taught in Virginia, from in 1987 uh, are the students that I worked with constantly, you know, doing community projects. Um, planning to see one of them in May, uh, who's living in California now. And so it's really those are the students uh, that you end up developing those longer lasting relationships with, with the faculty. Um, improved satisfaction with college experience. The students who have been engaged in these kind of service learnings are happier with their college experience. And they're also happier with their institution. Uh, the institution likes to hear that because they're more likely to give money. You know, they're more likely to send a check after you graduate. 
There's also personal outcomes, personal benefits that happens when students engage in service learning, a uh, better sense of identity of who they are, their own moral development, uh, increased ability to work with others. I mean, you guys all know when you have to do these real projects and you're working with groups, you have to learn a lot of skills as far as how to, how to make some of these decisions together. Leadership skills and communication skills can also be improved. And then there's the social outcomes that I think are really important. Um, reducing stereotypes. A lot of times when you're working with communities, you approach with certain preconceptions of what's going to happen in those communities or how people are going to respond to you. And these kind of service learning opportunities help to reduce those kind of stereotypes. It helps to promote a cultural understanding, that you start understanding uh, some, of the com some of the groups that you might be working with that, that you didn't know before, and increasing your social responsibility and also your commitment to service. So why is it that we stop working with the community or we stop working on a project when a class is over? Many of you have been, I know many of you, in the 170 class last quarter. You know, we're working, it was a real project. You had real clients. There were great ideas you had. Uh, how many of you have continued to pursue those ideas? How many of you have taken other studio projects and actually thought about things and said, you know, I'm gonna keep working on that? And we do have a number of students that do that, but I wanted to talk today because I think that we have great opportunity for more students to be able to take other things that you've done and continue working with them. Um, so I wanna talk about that, the ways that you continue, uh, how you can continue your learning, some opportunities here, I'll go into those more detail, and then some of the previous student examples, some efforts that we've done before. Um, so why do you stop? Well, it was an assignment. The project's over. Uh, you know, it's not required. Nobody's making you do it. Uh, you've sort of lost interest. You're tired of doing that project, you know. You're ready to move on to something else or there's other things to do. There's lots of reasons why we don't continue working on things. But there are ways here at the university that you could keep working on projects. Uh, you can sign up for an independent study. The faculty are available to sign up for independent studies if there is a project that you want to do. Uh, you might be able to take this as one of your restrictive elective units. Uh, in ex uh, some circumstances, it may be that we could waive one of your studio requirements and that you could actually work on this instead. We've also had students in the past take group studies. That's actually where a few of you decide you want to work on something together, and you decide that you're going to continue that. We had students a few years ago work on a design competition, and we um, set up a group study project, so they worked on the design competition. They got studio credit for doing that. And so really taking that motivation on your own and trying to look for the places where you could do that. The great place and the place where I've seen this happen more often is using your senior projects. You know, I think all of you are looking for things. What am I going to do for a senior project? How am I going to progress? And so taking a project that you've worked on in one of your other studios or something that you really are very interested in, where you want to be engaged in the community and do it for your senior project is a great idea. Volunteering, so going outside the university, offering to continue to help with the community after you're done with school, or even consulting. Uh, we've had students who actually will end up negotiating with whatever the agency is that, that they've been working on and getting some money for doing some of the work that they've been doing. So some of the, I've got four efforts, four student projects, or um, four communities at least, where um, students have continued to work on the projects that I wanted to talk about. Um, the first one is Knight's Landing. And Knight's Landing, this was actually... Um, a studio that we started, and it was in, um, I think, the late, the late 1990s, like 98, 99. Actually, I've been here since 1990. I was trying to think. I don't, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> it's in 99. And so we actually started in this community um, as a studio class, and it was doing a community goal-setting project. It was really to help them to start understanding what was important to them and what they really wanted to focus on. I think a lot of times what happens in studios is we get so called up and trying to figure out a design solution is that we often forget to look at the larger context for our work and really to think about you know, what would, would we be doing or what should we be doing. I think oftentimes, and you'll find this in private practice as well, you'll be approached by a client that says, you know, we'd like to do a new entryway design for our community. 
And when the heart of the matter is that what they really want is they want economic development in the town. You know, they want a new entryway because they want it to look nicer. They want people to stop. They want people to spend their money. And so sometimes, as designers, you sort of take what they tell you that they want and you just go with it without be looking beyond and figuring out what is the real issue here, what is the thing that I really should be addressing. And so one thing that we tried to do in Knight's Landing is to, um, to really look at the, the bigger issues and to look at the goal setting. And what this did is that this really let us um, focus on um, sort of starting to prioritize, and you'll see this theme in some of the other projects as well, start to prioritize and figure out what needs to be next and what needs to be done first. Um, also working in communities like this, it helps you understand, as I was saying before, the cultural differences and the things that would work or not work in this community. One thing in the community goal setting in Knight's Landing is that we came up with a list of possibilities, a list of things that they wanted to have there. And we started realizing that some of the things that were our preconceptions of what we thought might work in a community weren't going to be appropriate for this community. One of the things that the students had on the list of possibilities is to have a community garden. You know, that's one thing landscape architects, we often say, oh, let's put in a community garden. That's a great community building thing, a great, well, when you're working in a community like Knight's Landing, Knight's Landing is 30 minutes north of Davis. It's on 113 past Woodland. Uh, Knight's Landing has a lot of migrant farm workers. And the whole idea of putting in a community garden was not something that appealed to them at all. If they wanted to grow a tomato, then you had to grow a tomato, and they were going to do that in their backyard. Uh, what they wanted to do is have a place for parties. You know, they didn't want to have a place that they were going to have to go and work in a field. And so that was really important. You know, the students learned real quick that they had to really be thinking about this from the, from the mindset of the people who live there. One of the first things, one of the things that came out of the goal setting is that there was a nice piece of property uh, next to one of the elementary school that they wanted to have as that community gathering place. They wanted to have a place to bring uh, all the different residents together uh, there's a cultural divide in Knight's Landing. As I said, there was a lot of migrant workers, but there's a, a lot, a lot of um, wealthier Anglo population that have lived there for many, many years. And we heard from both sides that they wanted a place where that they could all come together, that it wasn't the Anglo community place, it wasn't the Latino community place, but it was a place for everybody to come and socialize and, and to work together with that. And so the park master plan really really looked at that. It looked at um, a lot of different places um, as far as recreational uses, but also these other kinds of community places. There were several components within that master plan that we developed that three different students picked up and continued working on after the master plan was developed by the class. And those were a design for a playground and then for the Family Resource Center. The Family Resource Center was a new building that they wanted to put in this piece of property that would be a place where a dentist could come once a week, so that a doctor could come once a week, so that they could have trainings for maybe child, for daycare workers, that they might have some adult education kind of classes. And so the Family Resource Center was something that they saw was really integral as far as the long-term success of the community. And so one of the students, or two of the students, worked on pieces of that, and I'll go through go through those. Um, the playground design uh, was really interesting because it was not, on the goal setting, it was not a top priority. Uh, because they already had a playground. It wasn't great. It was old. It was beat up. But what happened at the very end of the goal setting and the master plan process was the school district found from our analysis that the playground equipment wasn't up to code without saying anything to school or anything to any of the community members, they sent someone in and they ripped it all out. And so suddenly, the school had no play equipment whatsoever. And so it really changed the priorities of wanting to get something in there. Um, Marlies Nigel was one of our um, uh, students at the time. And um, Marlies was um, really appalled that this had happened and was very excited about continuing to work with some of the children that we had been working with before on the master plan. And so she continued working on this for her senior project. You can take a look at that if you're interested. 
Uh, but she did a really wonderful job where she worked uh, in the summer, actually, with the students. She, um, these were, many of the kids didn't have a lot of experience of going to other places. She was trying to get them to get ideas about what they wanted to have in a playground. And so she saw the real need to organize a tour. So she got vans together and took them around the region and had them look at different playgrounds and had them look at things to see what they liked and didn't like and came up with ideas about what she could use you know, based upon that. And then she was actually able to carry the playground all the way through to actually getting some play equipment installed at the school. Um, one thing that we learned, you know, we always have these ideas for playgrounds that we think, oh, well, it has to be all natural. We want natural pieces. We want some rocks. We want a stream. We want lots of plants. Uh, we thought, well, we can get people to come in and we can build some things on a Saturday. What we learned from them is they wanted to buy something. They wanted something that was just as, they wanted to see that they were just as good as any other school in the district or any other school in the county. And to them, if they had to build it themselves, that wasn't going to be good enough. And so we really had a little bit of a struggle philosophically for us. It was like, do we really want to buy some catalog play equipment piece? But that was really what was important to these kids and to the parents, is they wanted something that they could buy. Uh, and then we've tried to incorporate some other natural elements into it as well. As far as the Family Resource Center, we had a couple of other students that followed on after uh, the playground got installed. Um, one was um, Matt ended up doing this, I think, as an independent study. And I think he may have gotten some credit for it for one of Byron's classes. But he designed a whole irrigation system and for the, all around the Family Resource Center, figured out all the walkways. He also secured donations of plant materials. He got everything donated. He ended up getting plants from uh, Environmental Hort here on campus. He got lots of different things from the, I think it was from the County Parks Department. But he organized this effort. And then we had a work day where we actually did have the community come out and do their own installation. And um, it was really great. One thing that we um, had identified earlier on is that one of the skills that was really present in the community is laying pipe and putting in irrigation systems. And so we definitely had all the expertise that we could ever ask for as far as getting the irrigation system installed. Um, one of the things that we came across, though, in designing this and, and doing the installation that day and it just showed that you never, never quite have enough information. You never know everything. As one of the school district, the school district wanted to have somebody out there to supervise that day. And um, he was like stopping everybody and saying, wait a minute, what are you doing? And we're like, what do you mean? He said, well, you're planting trees. And we're like, yeah, we you know, got trees. We're going to have shade. It's going to be really nice. It's he said, well, you know, trees are going to have leaves. And somebody's going to have to pick up all those leaves. And so he's there because he's concerned about the maintenance. And he's concerned about who's going to rake, and rake the leaves. And it had already been approved through the school district. And I won't go into all the other crazy kind of uh, questions that they had about what was being done. But there's always, you have to always be prepared that there's last minute glitches and last minute things that people are going to come in and ask you about and want to know about. Um, Another piece at the Family Resource Center that I don't have any good photographs of, but you can actually, I checked, and her senior project is in, in the research library, is Kathleen Coleman's um, entry wall design. We did an entry wall at the Family Resource Center uh, where she actually went over several weekends and had, had some of the school kids design tiles. And they did ceramic tiles. And then they did this great uh, mosaic stucco wall uh, as an entryway that people could sit around as a waiting area outside the Family Resource Center. And so it was yet another spinoff, another project from what started as a goal setting plan with a community. And we began to identify some of the different projects that could happen there. Another project I wanted to talk about, and I'll have to go through these sort of quickly, is um, one that a graduate student did. And I wanted to mention this one because it grew out of a, a very small idea. I had a graduate class 
one day, it was a beautiful spring day, we said we'd all go sit outside. It took us a while. We finally found a place where we could all sit, and we were talking about place and what, what effect place has on community building. And does having a place for people to gather really help facilitate building community? Does it make people come together? And so she started taking this idea and building upon that. And then she um, wanted to do something at the Spearmore College. I don't do, are you guys familiar with the Spearmore College here on campus, uh, close to the domes? And there's the garden there. There's like a community garden. And she wanted to create a gathering place there. Because one thing that she had found from her experiences there is that people, there wasn't a place to gather. That people might see each other when they're gardening, but there was never a place for people to come together. And so she had this idea of creating a space there. And um, she actually did a group study that she offered to uh, the undergraduate students that she and another student led and went through a whole process of design. They actually uh, interviewed you know, a lot of people that live in the area and did some workshops to get people to involve, be involved in um, designing it. These are just some examples of the actual construction process. Um, some of the responses from the community members that participated is that they really did want a place for meeting new people. That was why one of the reasons they wanted to, to work on the project to begin with, uh, that they really felt more of a sense of ownership once they had been involved in this project. They also felt an increased sense of community from, from working on the project, and that they were also more willing to take on future efforts. Some of the things from the students who have worked on the project is that they really felt that it was important, the reflection piece that I talked about before. They thought, thought that that was one of the best things for them is to be able to sit and talk to other students about what they were learning and about what they were getting out of that whole experience. Um, they felt that they had a better understanding of the people in the community than what they had come in with. Um, they, they really reflected on place meaning as far as what the garden meant to those people. Uh, and they also realized that there were many commonalities between the gardeners, gardeners that they had not seen before. Um, they, the gardeners have a wide range, or at least they, they did at that time. There were um, some, some um, retired members of the university who still had plots there. And there were also a couple of teenagers who had plots who were using the, uh, the garden as, social gathering, as a social gathering place. And so it was important for, for our students to understand what were the things that they had in common. And it was also helpful for the people in the community to understand what they had in common with each other, too. The next one is another senior project. And I wanted to talk about this one quickly. Just because I think this appeals to a lot of people as far as it's a labor of love. Many of you probably got into the major because there was something that happened to you growing up or there's some place that's really important to you in your life. And this was um, Daniel's high school. And he was really interested in going back and doing something for his high school and wanting to do a garden at his high school. And so it was really important that he was able to take this and not just do you know, a conceptual plan, not do something where he was off on his own and doing, but he was very engaged with the teachers, very engaged with the students, and coming up with something that they could actually implement. And they actually did the construction process as part of the senior project. And so he was actually able to get some crews out there and put things in. It was, um, you know, uh, very satisfying to him that he could feel like he actually made a difference at that school. Uh, it also got recognition you know, at the university as well. They ended up doing a little story that talked about how you know, it had some impact you know, in the community you know, for this place. Um, the next one, some of you guys may have actually been involved in this project at the early stages. And I actually have uh, some of you guys know Daniel Linger here. I know Elizabeth's here, so she was part of this project. Uh, this was a project that I think is important to talk about because when we first began it, we were like, oh my gosh, what are we doing? The first time we did our site visit, we were like, what can we do? The school is in such horrible shape. There's nothing we can do here. Where do you begin? We were sort of at a loss. I think some students in the class finished the class still feeling at a loss that they didn't know what they were doing. It wasn't at all glamorous. It wasn't a glitzy project. 
But as it's turned out, you really have to listen to the people there. And you really have to listen to what their goals are and what their objectives are. And that's really um, directing and the energy that's come out of that project has really been remarkable. So Daniel, I'm going to have you come up and just talk for a minute about some of the things that you're working on on that. Does that work? Okay. <clears throat> okay, so yeah, Patsy just wanted me to talk a little bit about the Grant High School Master Plan project that some of you are familiar with. And uh, I've just continued on with and it has developed into my senior project. So for those of you who don't, aren't familiar with the project, I'll briefly describe the project. Um, Patsy's, uh, one of Patsy's students that she had a while back, Daniela, teaches at Grant High School a landscape design class. And it's part of an environmental design and science academy. Um, and it's set up to be a kind of a professional program to teach these kids about landscape design, which uh, is perfect. And so what we did was we, bas we basically went through the process, the design process of, uh, of research and, um, and design. But what, what I wanted to talk, talk about and what Patsy wanted me to explain a little bit was kind of um, what was my motivation with really going, going on with this project. Um, sorry about the microphone. I'm not too familiar with what you have here, but... Um, okay. uh, when I was first introduced to the project, I, I was immediately very excited because I kind of came from a, a somewhat similar uh, high school that Grand High School was. Not nearly as bad, but, but it was also in very poor uh, condition. So, and I've always, I've, I always wanted to redesign my high school. And so when I saw this, I saw a real opportunity to... Um, kind of take this energy of what I, what I wanted to do with my high school and see how far we could really take it. Um, you know, the parameters were kind of set. We, we were going to come up with a master plan design and we were going to work with the students on, on how we do that, on, on coming up with the master plan design. But I really wanted to see how far could we really take it. Um, could we go beyond just handing them a master plan in the end and having it be a good, feel good experience? Um, so, the, uh, and Patsy, Patsy was great because she allowed us the flexibility to kind of explore this, explore how we wanted to approach the project. So, um, the idea came of exploring funding opportunities and uh, really researching um, how important the school environment is to academic and behavioral performance for students and teachers. And then uh, the idea came to create a film kind of document the process, act as a persuasion piece uh, uh, in, in presentations to gather support and funding and, and so forth. So uh, luckily we contacted someone in the, in the film department and he was great and wanted to work with us and we uh, came out with a film and, and it uh, was a key component in a lot of our presentations that we then gave afterwards, which, so I don't want to go beyond my uh, beyond myself I, I'm not going to follow this exactly maybe you can. Um, one thing we came across was so we realized this wasn't going to just end at the quarter or it had a huge potential to go beyond just the quarter um, it would, and it was exciting but we had to, I had to make the decision whether we really wanted to continue this through the summer in the fall, this was going to be a long-term project or not, and just leave it as it was. But the momentum was so good, and we saw so much potential there, that it was hard to, to just let it go. Um, so we came across uh, an article in the newspaper as we were going through this process, and an uh, article in the newspaper talking about uh, the Department of Fish and Wildlife wanting to um, fund bringing habitat into the schools. So it was a perfect fit for what we were doing. 
We contacted them, gave them a presentation. They're super excited about it. So we are. Um, then there was the Sacramento Tree Foundation, who has a huge goal of uh, planting, a, you know, I don't know how many thousands of trees in the next couple years. Uh, there, we presented them the project. Super excited about it. So there was a, there was a number of presentations that we that we did over the summer. The school board, uh, chamber of commerce, the new dis the new uh, district, and. Um, the momentum just kept going, and it was really exciting. And at that point, I decided that I should probably take this on as my senior project, given that I've put so much time into it already. Um, and before I close, and you can probably wrap up some of the other uh, things that I haven't <laughs> touched on in the grant, to keep you up, to, to kind of bring you up to what's happening now, we are submitting a proposal for the, the west entry um, of the Grant High School. Uh, that'll hopefully happen by the end of next week for the Fish and Wildlife Department who are um, going to hopefully uh, provide some funds for this. And, and so that, that'll be happening relatively soon. And then as, my, as part of my senior project, what I'm working on is not a traditional master plan, but as it says here, a master, master plan guidelines to really integrate this into the school system. They have a landscape design class there, and they have tied, the teacher's a professional landscape architect. Everything is set up perfectly to kind of do an in-house um, piecemeal uh, project on this campus. And so what I'm going to work on is, is kind of uh, help creating a guideline, guideline master plan for it, and uh, hopefully set up a system and uh, relationships so that it can uh, happen on a yearly basis. Um, I think, I think I should probably close. Let's see. Did you want me to say anything else? Some of the joys and experience. And, and um, obviously, it's been extremely rewarding. It's been very rewarding to, to be a part of this project because often what we do is very theoretical in nature, and it ends. And uh, we don't really get to work with any real clients or real users. But this is really exciting um, to be able to have that kind of experience to work with uh, Real people on a real project, and that's I've I've learned a ton. I've had to give presentations and been in a lot of meetings. Uh, I had to get to know this uh, public school system uh, bureaucracy, which is part of the frustration. Sometimes uh, you get caught up in in a level of of red tape, but for the most part, everybody's been uh, very excited and motivated by the project. And so, um, and uh, to end. With these studio projects, has taken them beyond the classroom. You know, your professor found the project. They already found the job. Um, it's just up to you to kind of think of how, how can you take this beyond just the, just the parameters that they've set up for the studio. So I'll let you. Uh, I hope I Some people thought it was going to go nowhere. Um, but there are lessons. I'm not going to go into these because I know we're out of time. There were just a couple of things I wanted to, to end on. Uh, sort of picking up on the theme that Mark talked about last week, or disappeared, about the whole idea of proactive practice. I think one thing that's happened in our profession, it was we sort of fallen into a trap because there have been government regulations with NEPA and CEQA requirements that there's so many community meetings you have to have and there's, you know, we become very reactionary and that we have dealing with reactionary. You know, there's people that are, you know, complaining about something being built and, and so we're often not having a vision. And so what I wanted to leave this with is to really think about um, visions and what you want to accomplish, you know, those, those dreams to really think about the bigger idea about what should be happening, not just what has to happen or what do people want to have happen, but what is the bigger vision. I learned a lesson early on in my career. I was working at a multidisciplinary office in Philadelphia. And one thing that office always did is they never stopped designing at the project limit lines. And 
I thought, well, you know, in school you're given your assignment, you're given your base map, and I see this all the time in studios. You guys draw up to the edge of the sidewalk. You don't even show what buildings are across the street. You don't show the whole context for it. What this office did in Philadelphia, it was amazing to me how many projects they got because the mayor of Baltimore would be looking at the drawing and go, oh, what is this over here? Oh, well, I just thought it would be nice if we did a little park on that corner. That would be a good, oh, that is a good idea. Six months, there would be an RFP. We'd put in a proposal. We'd get the contract. And so time and time again, they're thinking, the office was thinking, what is the bigger vision? What are the things that really should happen? And that they would just keep drawing and that they would include those things. And it led to other work. But I think what's more important is it really did address the importance of, of having the bigger picture. So I'll just leave you with those three, you know, the thoughts at the bottom. Dream big, share ideas, and then the thing that we came out with Garrett High School is plant the seeds. You know, it's plant those seeds of ideas to other people and see what, what takes hold. You know, who's going to take on to those things and who wants to pursue that. So, thanks. Yeah, I don't know how many of you guys know Joyce Testing, but she has great projects all around different communities. So if there's, you know, if you're ever itching to do some real work and do things, I can put you in contact with her. So. I, I, would, I would just add that uh, I think this, this is a very appropriate phrase here. Uh, and I'd emphasize plant the seeds. I mean, planting the seeds of design activism does not start when you get your degree or you have your license, it really starts now. Um, I think a lot of the stories that uh, Patsy shared uh, are important ones. And I think even uh, for people like us, that's the beginnings of our activism started uh, in school. So I, I guess the question I have for you is, what, what, had, what was there a moment that inspired you? Uh, did you do service learning activity as a student? What, what brought you to this type of work? Well, a couple of things. I didn't do service learning. And there was actually, um, we did community-based projects sometimes. But we never really did community engagement other than doing a community presentation. Uh, but one of my classmates, she was actually a year behind me, <clears throat> she inspired me to go out and do other things because she ended up on one of her hikes discovering a creek that somebody was dumping raw sewage into and ended up getting it declared you know, an EPA site and ended up getting lots of attention to the site and money that got brought into it. And so that made me start realizing, you know, why are we in the classroom all the time? You know, aren't there other things that we should always have our eyes open looking for things? But the thing that really brought me into doing more community engagement was, and, and many of the students that have had me have heard this story, is when I was working in Philadelphia, I was doing a project in Camden, New Jersey. Camden is very uh, low income, um, um, ethnically diverse community. And I was doing my site analysis you know, for a park. And there were all these young African American men playing basketball in the parking lot. Well, the program that we were given by the city included six tennis courts, but it didn't include any basketball courts. And so to me, it was like, OK, why are we designing this park with these elements when this is the community that's going to be using it? And so that really started me questioning and doing research and trying to learn more about how do I get other people involved in making these decisions instead of just sitting back and letting the, the paying client, whether that's the city or the county or whoever it is, make those decisions, that those decisions should really come from the people who are going to be using the place. And so that's why I ended up going back to graduate school and was really the focus of my study at that time. practitioners are the ones that continue doing 
volunteer work and share their time on boards, you know, planning boards, design review boards. And, and you know, I see neighborhoods that are really successful is where the whole neighborhood participates in, in design and, and bettering their neighborhood, whether it's a low income neighborhood or a high income neighborhood. It's really volunteer time, volunteering your service. It's a great way to meet other people and to get new jobs. I mean, that should be your motivation, but you're surprised that you have to be alluded to it. It's where you meet people and where you make contacts and you know what you can bring to the table as far as you know, community success. And uh, I think Skip raises a good point. I think a lot of what I show were lower income communities, but this applies to any community you can think about. And we had some experience um, working with Randy Hester down in, in Los Angeles. And, and they were working with you know, some of the wealthiest people off of Mulholland Drive. But it was that how to engage people in making some of those decisions and getting them to understand the complexity of you know, their whole community was really important. Well, on that note, get out and find a project. <laughs> See you next week.